A Tale of Two Fevers Jerry is a two-year-old boy with fever for three days, rhinorrhea, and cough. On arrival, he's fussy with a temperature of 40.1 degrees Celsius, heart rate 188, respiratory rate 42, blood pressure 100 over 70, SpO2 99%. Lucy is a two-year-old girl with a fever and no other symptoms. She's tired but interactive. Her mother had just given her an antipyretic prior to arriving to the emergency department. Temperature is 37.9 degrees Celsius, heart rate 148, respiratory rate 32, blood pressure 98 over 68, SpO2 98%. Who has the systemic inflammatory response syndrome? Who has sepsis? Who needs resuscitation? And who needs reevaluation? You make tough calls when caring for acutely ill and injured children. Join us for strategy and support through clinical cases, research, and reviews, and best practice guidance in our ever changing acute care landscape. This is your pediatric emergency playbook. Welcome to the playbook. I'm your host and coach, Tim Horachko. I get it. If you look at a young child wrong, he'll have a fever. Am I right? It's common. It's natural. It's potentially beneficial. Fever can boost the immune system and it can release interferon 1 and set the body's metabolism to containing the infectious vector. Fever itself is not dangerous, but the cause may be, and that's our conundrum in the ED. Treating the fever is a balance. On the one hand, NSAIDs and acetaminophen may blunt antibody-producing B cells by inhibiting cyclooxygenase 2. On the other hand, if the child is a hot little firecracker who won't eat or drink anything until he feels better, then we'll take the theoretical downside to maintain hydration and avoid a very real and dangerous state of dehydration. We treat the fever in the ED so that we can observe and reassess. Remember that observation is a test. Ibuprofen is not an antimicrobial. So if Jerry is happy and he's taking liquids 20 minutes after a dose, then our previous impression of viral syndrome is supported. And all things equal, we may continue to observe him at home. If Lucy only marginally improves, there is still a sneaking suspicion that we don't have all of the information we need to make a decision. In her case, it's a concerning presentation without a preliminary source. I want to ground this discussion at the bedside. We treat patients, not numbers, or SERS alerts, or sepsis protocols. If we were treating Jerry or Lucy as adults, they would both be lined and labbed and launched upstairs before you can say, welcome to the playbook. This was the problem with the definition and criteria from the previous 2005 International Pediatric Sepsis Consensus Conference. It closely mirrored the adult criteria. It was all with good intentions. It was based on the best evidence that we had at the time. On the one hand, the detection of sepsis was poor and we could have done a better job. So we accepted the high sensitivity and low specificity. On the other hand, iatrogenia is real, not to mention the increase in unnecessary resource utilization, the hand wringing on our parts, and the PTSD inducing to the parents and the children involved. In 2016, the Sepsis 3 Task Force adapted its definition of life-threatening organ dysfunction for the electronic medical era. Soon following, in 2019, the Society of Critical Care Medicine updated its pediatric sepsis definitions to be applicable across settings with varied resources. In children with an acute infectious disease presentation, there was still a large gap between sick and not sick. The sick, the critically ill, are not very common. The well, well, they are. The gap, children who don't easily fit the sick or not sick paradigm, they are a large group that we can get wrong. 
So in that case, we try harder. We do an even better history and physical. We treat and observe for a short period of time. We're trying to balance our sensitivity and specificity. Sometimes we just have children who need more objective data. In 2024, the Phoenix sepsis score has shifted our conceptual framework to redefine sepsis and septic shock in children. Before we go further, I want to be clear that the new definitions for severe sepsis and the Phoenix criteria are not a sepsis screen. You are. Your clinical judgment, the time and energy you take to look, listen, and feel, your efforts to pay attention and do what is right for the little patient in front of you, that is the most valuable part of this process and the most advanced sepsis screen we have. It's us. Do what is right for that patient. If you think little Lucy just needs a urinalysis, some Motrin, and a reevaluation, excellent. If you get more of a history and find that she's not vaccinated and that there aren't any sick contacts and that, well, her mucous membranes are actually pretty dry and she isn't taking anything substantial by mouth, then your own sepsis screening is positive. So go looking. Do what you need for your patient. Sometimes that will include escalating or even de-escalating the investigation. What we'll talk about now is the child that you are concerned about. The child who has an infectious etiology who probably should be admitted or the child who you know for sure needs to be admitted, but you're trying to figure out to what level of care. Maybe you don't have a pediatric ICU. Maybe you don't have a pediatric ward at all. Among those children who are not obviously critically ill yet, who needs more resources? Now we can talk about the Phoenix criteria for pediatric sepsis and septic shock. The Phoenix sepsis score was based on a multivariate analysis of 3.6 million patient encounters made possible only through the progress of the electronic medical record and machine learning. Investigators sat down with other content experts and used a modified Delphi approach, a series of human-to-human refinements to present the final model. The result is a point system derived and validated to predict in-hospital mortality from sepsis and septic shock in children. In high-resource areas, such as most developed countries, sepsis by this definition carries a 7.1% mortality, and in resource-low settings, a 28.5% mortality. If there are 25 million cases of pediatric sepsis yearly worldwide, that on average represents 3 million deaths. There are four high-yield organ systems that were included in the final model. Respiratory, cardiovascular, coagulation, and neurologic. Once the patient with a suspected infection reaches two or more points, he qualifies as having sepsis. If any one of those points includes a cardiovascular criterion, that is septic shock. We'll go through each organ system, then do a little simulation of our own at the bedside. Respiratory. This has to do with the ratios of inspired oxygen, your FiO2, and either your PaO2 or your SpO2. The investigators wanted to make sure these criteria could be used by clinicians in a variety of resource conditions. I'm not going to go through all of the criteria numerically because no one can remember that. But let's use a narrative format. We'll just talk. You get zero points for a normal PaO2 to FiO2 ratio. So if we're breathing normal room air at sea level, our normal PaO2 to FiO2 ratio is going to be 500 or more. 
while a normal SpO2 to FiO2 ratio will be close, about 400 or better. For the respiratory criteria for Phoenix, you get one point if you're giving any amount of respiratory support and you don't achieve a minimal normal ratio. So for example, if you give a young child one liter nasal cannula and the child is not at 97% or greater, that's going to calculate into one point. Once you're mechanically ventilated and have anything other than the perfect ratio, that is two points. You get three if you're worse off. Under the Phoenix score, you can qualify for sepsis based on the amount of oxygen you require. The cardiovascular score has to do with the mean arterial pressure, the lactate level, and whether vasoactive agents are used. You get zero points for a lactate less than five or for a fifth percentile mean arterial pressure. So you can see that the bar is a bit raised here to show whether shock is present or not. At this point, the typical language of compensated and decompensated shock is not used. We are way past that. We are going to talk about sicker patients. And even those patients still get a zero point. Now you'll get one point for a lactate between five to 10 millimoles per liter, or if you use one vasoactive medication. Makes sense. But again, this is a stringent use of the word shock. Softer maps give you one point, and more about that in a moment. You get two points each for a lactate of 11 or higher, two or more vasoactive agents, or a terrible map. So you can see the cardiovascular criteria are not easy to achieve. As promised, a quick sojourn on mean arterial pressure in children. We can talk about this all day, and you know me, so don't encourage me. I'll explain generally a normal map and then compare that with the sepsis criteria. Mean arterial pressure, as we remember, is one-third of our systolic pressure plus two-thirds of our diastolic pressure because, well, we spend one-third of our time in systole and two-thirds of our time in diastole. So for a 70 kilogram, 18 year old man child who has a perfectly acceptable blood pressure of 120 over 80, his map is going to be 90. For adults, a map of 65 or greater is often the goal in most septic shock states. We need an age-based formula to calculate mean arterial pressures for children. If you just do the math and consider a theoretical child at 50 percentile for height, 50 percentile for weight, and then plug in normal systolic and diastolic blood pressures. Well, math, 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 blam. Here you go. The formula is 1.5 times the age plus 55 gives you the very average mean arterial blood pressure for that child of that age. So a one-year-old would have a map of 56.5. A three-year-old, 1.5 times three plus 55 is 59.5. Five-year-old with 62.5. Seven-year-old, 65.5. Nine-year-old, 68.5. At 11, 71.5. And at 13, 74.5. Obviously, there's no such thing as 0.5 of a map, but you get the idea. There's a formula to take into consideration the age, 1.5 times the age plus 55 is the very, very normal 50th percentile. Now you can also get there if you know roughly the acceptable blood pressure for that age and use the same calculations of one third systolic, two thirds diastolic. But if you want another way, it's 1.5 times the age plus 55 is the mean arterial pressure. The coagulation domain has to do with platelets, INR, D-dimer, and fibrinogen, the usual acute inflammatory response culprits. As long as your platelets are above 100, your INR is less than 1.3, and you have a normal D-dimer and fibrinogen, you get zero points. One point each for a max of two for anything above those values. So say your three-year-old has pneumonia, gets two liters of nasal cannula and does not have a perfect response, that's going to be one point. 
You look into his platelets. They're less than 100. That's another point. And those two points together mean sepsis. He would need a cardiovascular parameter to qualify for septic shock. The neurologic criteria are pretty liberal. As long as your Glasgow Coma Scale is greater than 10, no point for you, zero. GCS 10 or less, just one point. You get two points if your pupils are fixed bilaterally. So you can see here that different criteria are weighted differently in the scoring system. A higher weight to specific changes in respiratory support or cardiovascular function or coagulation, but neurologic status isn't as heavily weighted in that criteria. And this may be more of a function of trying to get more specificity over sensitivity. A brief word about special populations. The Phoenix criteria are for children under 18. It does not cover preterm neonates, so the recent NICU graduate, for example. However, because this data set is so large, 3.6 million pediatric encounters is what it's based on, it can be applied to previously healthy children as well as those with chronic conditions or special needs. This is an amazing inclusionary accomplishment when it comes to research. We shouldn't try to memorize the Phoenix criteria. They are not something we're going to use every day and certainly not something you want to use as your own screening tool for sepsis. Remember, that's you. Let's apply the criteria to a few common scenarios. Just want to give you some heuristics, some rules of thumb that may trigger you to go back to the criteria and actually calculate them when needed. Back to Jerry. Jerry is our two-year-old boy with high fever and rhinorrhea, 40.1 degrees Celsius, heart rate 188, respiratory rate 42, blood pressure 100 over 70, SpO2 99%. Yes, he is a hot, angry bird, but that doesn't mean he is ill-appearing. He's symptomatic of his fever, which you ascribe to viral syndrome. His heart rate is high for his age. So you want to see that go down. You want to see if the fever has much to do with it. You give him an antipyretic to reassess. 30 minutes later, his mother is asking to go home. Jerry has successfully pulled out every otoscope specula from the wall. Without slipping on them, you reassess. You see that his heart rate is now in the 140s, which is much closer to the normal for his age. His respiratory rate is in the 20s again, normal for him, and he's staring back at you with a very proud grin. This would have been a positive systemic inflammatory response alert, a SIRS alert, but no more SIRS. It's too sensitive. And let's face it, Jerry's already over it. He goes home with supportive care and return precautions. You're feeling pretty good about your clinical acumen, and you go back to see Miss Lucy. She was the other two-year-old with no other symptoms. It's been two hours since you ordered the urine and the results are back. They're positive. You go back to see her and she is sleeping in mom's arms. She feels hot again. You repeat her vitals. Her blood pressure is 60 over 36. You kind of don't believe it, but you should. Yes, she is sleeping, but also, yes, she has an infection. If you calculate her map, math, 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 it is 44. What should her map be on average? Remember, age times 1.5 plus 55. For her, that's 58. That prompts you to look up the Phoenix criteria. For her age, she gets one point, and it's a cardiovascular one. What's her GCS now? She's responding to painful stimuli. That's going to be about an eight. Lucy is in septic shock. Now, I know you would have told me, hey, infection plus hypotension, doi. Yes, indeed, doi. Remember, you are smarter than any score. That was a blatantly obvious example. But how about this? You re-examine Lucy. She wakes up. She's fussy. Her blood pressure is 110 over 70. Her heart rate is in the 130s. She feels better with ibuprofen, but she keeps vomiting. 
So you decide to line and labber and your fast little fingers hover over the lactate order to click or not to click. You think about it for more than two seconds, so you commit. The lactate comes back, five. Her vitals are the same. She has sepsis. Oh, her platelets are less than 100. You know that because you got a CBC. That's another point. And now she has septic shock. I think it's a good exercise, not only to toggle around with the criteria, but also to do some toggling of our own medical decision making. You could have easily lined and labbed Jerry who had a viral illness, and maybe you found some lab abnormality to commit him to an admission. He could have had low platelets from, let's say, viral suppression, but he still would have been fine. Your decision of how far to go in the investigation sets the stage. You did the right thing by not going there. Lucy was another case. You didn't have a good explanation. She didn't get better with your standard care. She needed more investigation. She ended up with sepsis from a urinary source. And even though she didn't present initially in an obvious way. What do we take from this discussion? First, you are the screening test. Second, there is a considerable gap group between sick and not sick. Sometimes they need a re-evaluation and all is well. And sometimes they need more investigation and for us to remember that we have the benefit of the Phoenix sepsis score, a real step forward in balancing sensitivity and specificity for diagnosing sepsis and septic shock in children with a suspected infection. A few rules of thumb that you can use at the bedside. Remember, all you need are two points for sepsis. If one of the points is cardiovascular, it is septic shock. A map of less than 40 in small children is a red flag. That's at least one point. You put someone on nasal cannula and the SpO2 is 95%, that's going to end up being one point. You check a legitimate lactate. I'm talking short tourniquet time and the metabolic angels flew the sample to the lab themselves immediately and it ends up being five that's one point if it's above 11 two points that means a child with pneumonia needing supplemental oxygen whether that's viral or bacterial in origin with a lactate of five boom septic shock d-dimer elevated inr elevated platelets down all of those count in other words in a child with a suspected infection usually the gap kids two or more sepsis one of those are cardiovascular, septic shock. In the ED, it can be the best of times, it can be the worst of times. Ditch SIRS for your own good judgment and rise like a phoenix to fight sepsis and make a difference. Until next time, remember, you are the champion for the child in front of you. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Playbook. We welcome your comments, questions, and feedback. Email Tim at coach at PEMplaybook.org or drop by our website for show notes and more strategy at PEMplaybook.org. See you there.